Hi, this is Neil back with uh, hopefully the the last part out of five, part five out of five about the elect. And uh, I started this whole project with uh, Julie uh, Wedby's vision and uh, message that the Lord gave her about uh, the choosing of the elect. That it's in process right now. That the our Heavenly Father and His Council of Elders are making that decision. And then I've added in a whole lot of my own thoughts on top of that. So if they're finding a place in your heart, I will keep talking through another somewhere around 30 minutes. It seems like I end up having all these run 30 minutes or so. I want to, first of all, tackle three, four points before I get into the two parts I'm going to cover here. The four, one of those parts is the four important events of the Great Tribulation. And uh, and then I'm going to go through actually eight. Uh, uh, proofs is the wrong word uh, for what why I feel uh, evidences. That's my word. Four, uh, eight evidences that the the tribulation is actually 50 years long, a jubilee cycle. Doesn't mean it is. Doesn't matter what our opinions are about any topic, subject, and so on. We're not going to change what God already has in place. So what is going to happen was planned from the foundation of the world. Long before Adam and Eve came along, God made the plan. He, he put all the pieces together. The lamb was slain. So the length of the tribulation was already set long, long, long ago. And I mentioned, and I will again, Richard Booker, his testimony, he reported that the Lord told him that all of our theories we have in Christianity are wrong. The whole works of them are wrong. So that kind of uh, gave me an encouragement to keep going down that road. And the Lord kept showing me little bits and pieces that seemed to add up to the the fact or the, the revelation that the tribulation is actually a jubilee cycle. So I want to I want to cover four little things before I start, otherwise I'll forget them. I just watched all four videos and trying to put this all together. I keep referring to the Matthew 24, 28, where the Lord says, where the carcass is, there the eagles will gather. And uh, up until not a whole lot long a time ago, I had no idea what that meant. It was just like this random statement in the middle of a bunch of stuff that did a little, make a little bit more sense. The, Jesus was answering this question, how does the tribulation unfold? And all of a sudden he comes up with this, this what seemed to be an un understandable uh, statement. And uh, so I have I feel that our group received the the uh, solution to this. We, we were having a, a Sabbath meeting and we were reading through Matthew 24 and it, we came to that part and we we got talking about it and it just like the whole thing unfolded. It's like the Holy Spirit explained the whole thing to us. And again, this is my story, right? My testimony. But we could see right away and the old King James is good at this. It has lots of uh, related scriptures. It it uh, tie, you know it has in the margin related scriptures, and uh, it had only one right there, Hosea eight one, and uh, now I'm using my two modern translations that I've showed you, the JPS for the the what Christians call the Old Testament, and the uh, Roth Aramaic for the what Christians call the New Testament, which they're not. They're not Old and New Testaments. They're parts of God's Word. Anyway, stay off the rabbit trails, Neil. Uh, Hosea 8.1 says, Put a ram's horn to your mouth. And that a ram's horn was, uh, for the most part, used as a warning. Uh, like an eagle over the house of the Lord. Because they have transgressed my covenant covenant, and have been faithless to my teaching, which is the Torah. The teaching is the Torah. It's capitalized. Wherever you see teaching and instruction, sometimes it's together, but uh, 
often they're just one or the other, but they're always capitalized. And that's referring to the Torah. So the Lord's saying that uh, he has sent these watchmen. He sent these eagles who are over the house of the Lord. That is, they're the overseers, they're the watchmen. And they're, they're giving the carcass this message, this dead church. They're giving this message to the dead church. You have transgressed my covenant. And the covenant is uh, the new covenant. And explained in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. This is my the new covenant I'll make with my people. I will write my Torah on their minds and upon their hearts. This is really important. I want to bring it out about our hearts. The Torah needs to be written on our heart. And uh, and you have been faithless to my teaching, which is the Torah. You've been faithless. The, the, as I've, try, I've been trying to explain in many, many different ways, Jesus did not come and do away with the Torah. That's why he said in Matthew 5, 17 and 19, do not think I came to do away with the Torah and the prophets. Now, uh, backing this whole thing up a little bit, in Rick Joyner's vision, the, the eagles are very clearly the prophets. Now, uh, you could argue, well, that's not scripture. But here I'm showing you that uh, God's referring to an eagle, and, and I'm saying it's prophet slash watchman. You can make those connections yourself if you take in the whole of scripture. If, you, if you're used to reading all of from Genesis to to uh, in the revelation you'll be able to see these things so it's hosea 8 1 and referring back to matthew 24 28 the carcass the dead church so this is what's happening right now the lord has been sending the prophets really intensely starting last may i'm going to say uh, to wake the dead church up to to raise it from the dead so, are you listening, or is your are your ears still deaf and your eyes still blind? Me included. So, okay. Now, I, there's three other things I want to briefly touch on. Uh, I've brought up the festival of uh, Hanukkah a number of times, and many, many people will argue, "Well, Jesus kept Hanukkah," and uh, that's a that's a stretch, you know. There's a one-liner in one of the testimonies, and it says, "And it was the festival of lights, which is Hanukkah, and Jesus was at the temple." That doesn't mean he was keeping Hanukkah. It maybe he was. I mean, there's nothing wrong with respecting. It's about the dedication, rededication of the temple. There's nothing wrong with respecting that. But what's wrong is you haven't read all of Scripture, and you can't find that anywhere. I have an old old book with uh, with the uh, the what's called the apocrypha I think and it it has uh, Maccabees 1 and 2 and you can read the the historical account of of what happened there they rededicated the temple after it had been desecrated it had been fouled by the slaying of a pig on the altar I think is how it went and again that's going to that's a prophecy of what's going to happen again because God warns us through Daniel and Revelation that's going to happen again. That uh, there's going to be a deal made with uh, this beast power. And for seven years, but halfway through the deal, uh, they go in and, and foul the temple. They desecrate the temple by this abominable, abom abominable thing that's in the Holy of Holies on the, on the altar. Anyway, I'm getting too many rabbit trails here. I just want to clear that up. Uh, not to create ideas that don't have much foundation. You know, you, you argue about things that are silly, but all, all of God's word reveals there's nine appointed times he wants us keeping not, and it does not include Hanukkah or Purim or Christmas or Easter. Anyway, beat that one to death, so we'll leave it alone. Um, another point that came up when I was watching these, in the book of Joel, God said he would, in the last days, he would uh, give dreams and visions to 
all kinds of people, young people, old people, kids, and that's what's happening. But we wouldn't know about it if we didn't have the internet. See, God planned the internet. You know, he knew, obviously, that it was going to come on stream. And uh, it's needed for us to be able to see these things. And we got literally thousands of people re reporting to us dreams and visions they ha they've had. Our challenge is to sort through the whole thing. And there's going to be false ones there. There's going to be people coming up with stuff that came straight from Satan. And uh, the only way you're going to sort through it is with the help of the Holy Spirit and by knowing Scripture. Those two things. There's two ingredients there. And I want to also touch on who is the Prince of Persia when I told this story about uh, Daniel having this uh, going into a three-week fast. Well, he would have probably fasted longer, but it took three weeks before Michael arrived and, and said I had to fight the Prince of Persia. Well, that's a, a prince, a pr prince over a principality that is... Uh, Satan has his kingdom. He said, the whole world's mine when he was, uh, uh, after he'd fasted 40 days and, and he, he, it, we call it the temptation of Jesus. He, uh, Satan came to him and he uh, tried to get him to uh, fail at his job. And uh, one of the temptations was, fall, fall down and bow to me and I'll give you the whole world. I'll give you everything. Because it's mine to give. So uh, there's the revelation that the whole world belongs to Satan right now. So Satan has his princes. And of course there's lots and lots of fallen angels. Uh, so how this is all divvied up. Whether it's angels or demons or whatever. And demons are the children of the angels. Those are just particulars that don't matter so much. We will know these things eventually. But the prince of Persia was either a high-ranking uh, demon or uh, one of the cohorts in the fallen angels. And and uh, Satan, whoever the boss is, is running the show. And he's divvied everything up to his people. And that's why it says in Ephesians that, that we don't fight against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and wicked spirits in high places. There's uh, kind of like four divisions that it... Uh, goes through that Satan has a government and uh, anyway enough of that and for the last one uh, when I quoted this scripture I forgot to write it down it's Isaiah 26 I think 20 and 21 anyway I'll put it in my description but I referred to it a number of times uh, he tells his people go into the go into your dwelling lock the door, and uh, wait until my indignation passes. And I had made the comment that I think that's referring to the three days of darkness. But I'm, in thinking about it, I think it could apply to uh, three. It, would, it could have three applications. Not only to the three days of darkness, uh, that all of God's people have to be prepared for these. He's given lots of warning, lots of things to prepare, get some water, some food, some something to cover the windows. We're not supposed to let any light out. And the clear indication is all of God's people have to go some, through some of this great tribulation. When it starts and really heats up and gets intensely scary, and we're not supposed to be scared. If we've prepared properly, fear won't be part of it. But um, that's pretty tough for us humans to contemplate all this stuff and not have any fear at all, but that's where we want to get to. So, uh, this period where we go in and lock ourselves in the door and wait for the Lord's indignation to pass could apply to the three days, but also to the three and a half years that uh, in in Daniel, uh, sorry, Revelation 12, 6, I've talked about this a lot, this 144,000 are taken to this place of training that that also could apply to, you know, metaphorically, they're going into this place and lock the door. And God says he's going to protect the woman. And he chooses how to do it. But this is metaphoric, right? So then the third application, then after uh, Satan and this war in heaven, in the latter part of Revelation 12, then I've been 
proposing and speculating that's that three and a half times is referring to 49 years. The times factor is 14. The only unused time in all the times listed by Enoch. You know, in, in Genesis 1.14, it, it says that the sun and moon were put there to give signs for the appointed times, but also uh, to, to, have, to give us times and seasons. And anyway, the, 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 one of the understandings would be that the sun and the moon break down everything into times. And uh, uh, the only unused one I, I've proposed in all of the times that Enoch talks about, like the sun uh, breaks the year down into uh, 12 sets of 30, and then there's this uncounted day that's in between the seasons, and and there's all the signs that uh, uh, show us how to do that counting. So there's a breakdown of 30 days and 90 days and 91, and then the moon breaks uh, time down into sevens and 28 and uh, and the one or two days of the new moon festival and anyway there's that one where the 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 moon grows for 14 days and shrinks for 14 days that's not used for anything else i'm proposing that's the time listed in genesis 114 that we're using for three and a half times anyway you might find that a stretch but uh, it's part of what i feel god showed me why does he uh, say three and a half years in all kinds of different ways, 1,260 days and so on, three and a half years, and then all of a sudden says three and a half times. Uh, why wouldn't he say the same thing? Well, he's saying something different is what I'm proposing. Anyway, what I was trying to get across there is that this time that we're behind closed doors and that that's how we're protected by following the Lord's directions. And in the the three days of darkness, we're obviously in our own homes. He gives us, you know, uh, very clear instructions how to prepare for that. For the three and a half years, sounds like he's taken us to this place in the wilderness, and there'll be the angels there, and possibly Yeshua, and and I mentioned Paul and Enoch and Elijah, like people there to teach us and train us and so on. Hopefully, hoping I'm there and you're there. And then during the 49 years, the protection that's provided is through these places of, of safety, these uh, fulfillment of the cities of refuge. And Lois Vogelschart talks a lot about these places of, uh, of uh, shouldn't call them places of refuge, which she calls them. Anyway, it'll come to me, but places that God has set apart. And this is all part of the journey we're making to Israel. Okay, there's places to stop and rest. God is, puts his supernatural protection in certain places, but it's part of a journey we're going to be taking. And hopefully I'll get to there. Here we're at 18 minutes, so I better speed along. Okay, these are the four important events of the Great Tribulation that very few in the Christian world recognize and talk about. Ezekiel 20, 30 to 44 is a very, it could be called the, the key prophecy of the Great Tribulation. Explains it in a nutshell. I will take you out into the wilderness of the people. I will march you under the shepherd's rod. And I will uh, remove those who rebel against me from those who have a contrite heart that trembles as a word. And those rebels will never enter my land. Now, the, when we put all the pieces of the puzzle together, we find that after Israel goes through its, its judgment, which is right at the beginning of the tribulation, it will become a, a, a protected country through the entirety of the rest of the tribulation. I expect that will end at the three-and-a-half-year mark and possibly the seven-year mark. Uh, so anyway, what I'd like you to do is read all of Ezekiel 20. It ties the concept of the two exoduses together. The first exodus was a prophecy for the second one, which is the Great Tribulation. And it 
in the JPS it brings this out, but it really gets after the Christian church for its fetishes. We have fetishes. We have objects that we revere and we bring out in all our all our paganism and all this junk that we add that you can't find anywhere in Scripture. And uh, the two that jump out the quickest are Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny and the Easter eggs. But there's a ton of others. There's rosaries and there's oh crosses and and uh, like objects. Okay, there's the, the whole thing about Mary who isn't really Mary. Uh, who remained a virgin for her whole life and you know I just remembered this when we were in Israel we were at this church in uh, Nazareth was it anyway Pat had reminded me now I forget but at one of our trips through the through Israel and there was a church there and there was this huge statue in front of the church and it was a statue of Mary standing on the serpent a huge segment of the old doctrine in the Catholic Church teaches this. And not the modern Catholic Church, but it's still there in in Mexico and probably a good part of South America and obviously over in Israel. Uh, they teach that it was Mary that defeated the serpent, not Jesus. Anyway, it's, it's crazy. You know, it's a crazy doctrine and it's it comes from paganism. And anyway, I, I don't want to go down that rabbit trail. You can do all the re research on that stuff, but read all of Ezekiel 20 and to get this revelation of the comparison of the two exoduses. The first one being a prophecy of the Great Tribulation. Uh, okay, that's the one thing that will happen during the Great Tribulation. God is going to take his people to Israel. And he's not going to bring any rebels along. Rebels are people that refuse to have their hard heart healed. And I'll give you these scriptures I have many times in the book of Ezekiel. God reaches into our chest. He, he pulls the stone heart out of it. And he replaces it with a heart of flesh. And the metaphoric meaning is then we will receive the Torah. We'll let it be written on our heart. We'll believe God. And he says... Uh, don't lie, we don't lie. When he says, don't eat pigs, we won't eat pigs. When he says, keep my appointed times, we will, instead of men's appointed times, and you know, so on. But uh, the resistance we feel to God's ways, uh, and we say, oh, oh, la, 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 the law is done away, that is the hard heart. See, and God will take your hard heart out of you if you ask him to. So it's a, it's a miracle. Anyway, um, that's the one thing that will happen during the Great Tribulation. The most important thing, he's going to take us on a journey to Israel. And when Jesus said right at the end of his uh, answer to the events of the Tribulation, he said, the, then the, the angels are going to gather the elect and, and uh, bring them to me. Now, that doesn't mean it happens in one instant. I think it's the process of the whole tribulation. He's gathering his elect, which are his people, his church, and it keeps growing. I'm trying to explain this. It grows and grows and grows all through the tribulation. But the journey is towards Israel, literally. That is the destination that we're, we're headed for. And he makes a statement. Those who rebel will never enter my land. Anyway, that's Ezekiel 20, 30 to 44. Second thing that happens during the Great Tribulation is the two houses of Israel are healed back together. And I've taken a lot of time explaining that the house of Israel are Christians. That's the Christian church. The house of Judah is and are the Jewish people. Uh, these are two churches. These are two groups of people. These are the two, um, uh, the fallout from the Civil War back in uh, Solomon's time. And if you... If you read your scriptures right through, the history is all spelled out. God never lost track of either one, but the Jewish people are much easier to find. They know who they are, but uh, Christians don't know who they are. They think they're Gentiles. They're not. They're the descendants of the ten, lost ten tribes. And that doesn't mean that Gentiles are, are not invited into the camp. They always were and always will be. Any Gentile can enter, but they become an Israelite. They don't remain a Gentile. 
The word Gentile comes from the Hebrew word goyim. It means separated from God. So if you call yourself a Gentile, that means you're, you're professing that you are separated from God. No. Once you begin following God's instructions, all of them, and you start with the simplest things, uh, God will tell you where to start. Just like, like at the Council of Jerusalem, they, they told the new converts, here's where you start, gave them three, three simple rules to follow, but it, it was never meant those are the only three they ever follow. That's where they started. I mean, the teaching of the Lord is the same for everybody, and it's found in the Torah, in the whole of Scripture. And none of Scripture disagrees with itself. Nothing's ever been changed. Okay, two houses healed back together. That's Ezekiel 37, 15 to 28. Uh, now, the biggest thing of all the things that happened during the Great Tribulation is this good news and the hope of the kingdom will be preached to all the world, to every language, every nation, every tribe. There are 6,500 languages on earth. The, the good news is going to go all to all these foreign languages. And that's where the gift of, of the of foreign languages come from, from. We have this lingo in the uh, more of the charismatic side of uh, Christianity, but the lingo is speak in tongues. It means foreign languages. It's, it's real. It's literal. You speak in a foreign language. And then the complementary gift to that is interpreting the foreign language. So that is when this gift will really reach its full potential. We will be able to go, we being, hopefully, I'm among them, the elect, will go to every nation on earth and we will supernaturally be able to speak their language and understand their language. Those two gifts will then operate. Right today, we don't see the two operating. They, they're needed to operate together. And that's why Paul said, when you get together, don't just speak in tongues, but have an interpreter and just do one or two. So uh, uh, groups that believe in the gift of tongues, they call it, it's really the gift of foreign language. Uh, they should be as versed and hear every week. They should hear every week both gifts operate. Somebody should speak in tongues, and another person should interpret it, and it's the interpretation that builds the body. It's a, this inspired message from the, from the Lord, from the Holy Spirit. Anyway, that's three things that will happen during the Great Tribulation, and that one, last one was the most important one, because it's the Great Harvest. God is going to bring the millions, perhaps uh, approaching the billions into the kingdom during the Great Tribulation. The fourth one uh, is the, the journey back to Israel. I guess I expounded on that somewhat in my first one, taking us into the wilderness. Um, and we have to work in the concept of these cities of refuge. See, there were supposed to be, uh, if I remember my numbers right, there's six of them inside Israel and six outside. Now, I've said already, the whole land of Israel will be protected divinely during the whole tribulation after the either the three and a half or seven year mark. But these places sa safety are scattered all over the earth. And uh, apparently we've been had prophets tell us that Canada is going to be one of those countries, whether in whole or in part. And we get to see all these things. And... Uh, Okay, I'm at 29 minutes. I don't know if I can, I probably can't run through these uh, quickly enough. So maybe I better go to, to uh, episode 146 to finish this. But I'm going to go through the now eight evidences that the tribulation is 50 years long. And, and my purpose is not to try and convince anybody of, um, I guess I've said this many times, better to be prepared for something that doesn't happen than not prepared for something that does happen. But I'll go through them, the eight, and uh, I will try and cover any other loose ends that I ended up with.
and I think the project will finally be done. What I thought would take four episodes is now going to go into seven. So with that, this is Neil with Rock Our World.